It's October, and we are back with another episode of Crime After Crime. Hey, everyone. I'm John Lorden. And it's me, Danielle Hallen, and happy spooky season. It is spooky season. (laughs) But, you know, I know it's going to be a little bit different. It's just going to be different Mm because it's 2020. I was at the store the other day, and I saw all this great Halloween stuff. And, you know, I always do my yard for the kids. And I just, I didn't buy any because I'm like, I don't, is trick-or-treating even <laughs> happening? Like, I don't, I don't understand what's happening. We're all flying by the seat of our pants. Maybe I'll just eat candy alone on my couch this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what to do. Like, I, our family's buying. Are you planning on buying candy for your kids? Um, yes. I'm actually taking notes from last um, episode. Okay. And, or was it? No, it wasn't last episode. Yes, it was. And I'm doing Easter egg Halloween. Oh, great idea. Great idea. It's great, idea. right? I think yeah. so, too. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to do that for myself. Yep, and I'm just not telling the kids what the background <laughs> is behind the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't let them know. <laughs> Mommy, where's my pictures? I'm looking for pictures exactly. of my Easter egg. Like, nope, not this time. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of things that aren't going quite according to plan, of course, this was supposed to be the month of Crime Con. CrimeCon in Orlando has officially been canceled. Now, they're resetting for next year, which will be in Austin, Texas, in early June. That's going to be June 4th through the 6th. But all is not lost for this year. CrimeCon house arrest is coming to you on November 21st. And it sounds like Honda is excited about it. They are. My dogs are thrilled. (laughs) But you know what? Here's what it's not, you guys. It's not going to be a boring Zoom meeting or clicking play on videos. House Arrest is fully immersive, interactive online experience that will incorporate all of the best things about CrimeCon that I love and I'm going to miss. From Hmm. big name personalities to world-class experts, workshops, demos, exhibitor booths, and guess what? Even Podcast Row. Well, Danielle, what would Podcast Row be without Crime After Crime? Boring. We, it would be. It would be totally boring. But guess what? It's not going to be because we are confirmed to be at house arrest and you can join us. We can get you 10% off. Just go to crimecon.com slash house arrest and use code crime after 2020 when you're checking out. And we'll see you at CrimeCon house arrest streaming live on November 21st. And Danielle, we want to also welcome a brand new sponsor for our YouTube version of Crime After Crime. And it's a sponsor that I happen to know extremely well. I use their products on a daily basis. I am in love with Harry's. And I'm talking about the product there, just to be clear. (laughs) The founders, Jeff and Andy, noticed the same thing that I did. Men were being gouged for overpriced and overdesigned razors, so they got to work. Harry's has their own blade factory in Germany to make sharp and durable blades. Plus, Harry's just came out with their sharpest blades ever and they didn't raise the price. Nobody takes care of this face or my wallet better than Harry's. One of my favorite products is the appropriately named Post Shave Balm because it is truly the bomb. My face feels soothed, relieved, and rejuvenated after every single shave and one bottle goes a long way. The deal Harry's currently have on their trial set is amazing. You can feel the quality and the weighted handle and the textured rubber grip and also get a five blade razor cartridge, foaming shave gel, which is my personal favorite, and a travel cover to protect your blades when you're on the move. You'll have everything that you need for a close, comfortable shave and you'll be supporting crime after crime by signing up. Redeem your trial set for just $3 when you go to harrys.com forward slash crime after crime. Make sure you go to harrys.com forward slash crime after crime to redeem your offer and join the 10 million people, including myself, who have tried and love Harry's. So, uh, look, I'm really excited about Harry's. We want them to come back. So do us a favor. Take advantage of that offer. I it's know. a great deal. I've I mean, done... even if you're a Harry's user and you, it's just time for a new razor, it's three bucks. It's Come great, on. you guys. And I am someone I don't I'm not I'm not crazy about razors. But the second I got one of these, I was like, everything's changed. I have not. Yeah. I don't let anybody touch it. 
<laughs> I don't. I actually hide it under the bed. That's a long story, but <laughs> I promise there's a reason why. <laughs> hmm. Danielle's hiding razors under the bed, guys. Uh, anyone want to call that in? Um, <laughs> all right, everyone. We know you've been waiting. It's now time for voting results with Danielle for our last episode, the first episode of season three, Woo. Florida Woman. Danielle, what happened? All right, you guys. So first episode, kind of a big deal. And this is also like season three, but also second season of the season of revenge. <laughs> That's true. The season of revenge has been extended. <laughs> exactly. So on Twitter, <laughs> I won by 53% of the votes. Wow. John at 47. Dang. That's so, that's so close. And that honestly just, I thought you were going to win, but I'm, I'm not too surprised it was really close because we brought some really great stories. That is one of my favorite episodes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it too. And I can't, I'm, I'm proud. Are you kidding me? We were we pulling did, numbers that I close. loved it. I thought it was great. And then on the website poll, I had 58% of the votes and John with 42%. So that means season three total so far, one for me, zero for John. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that also means yeah. no, no cup exchange. I know. And, uh, look, Danielle, three losses in a row. And I think I know what's going on here. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Since I don't have the crime after crime mug, I've been skipping my morning coffee. Yeah. Okay. And, and my brain just isn't firing on all cylinders. So guess what, Danielle? Oh, boy. I went to crimeafterCrimePodcast.com and bought my own crime after crime mug from our Teespring store. And guess what, Danielle? What, John? <laughs> I've, I've got my own mug with my face. Team John. Team John <laughs> on my mug. But in true crime after crime fashion, Danielle, because even though we kind of have fun with the voting thing, yeah. we're always working as a team together. Exactly. So if you turn this mug around on the other side. Team Danielle. <laughs> team Danielle with some awesome artwork of both of us. And um, I'm going to have my coffee now. So you better watch out. I, I am going to watch out. I'm, I Look, you scare me sometimes. This is why I work so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious, but a huge thank you to the artist, Emily Rose. You can find her art on Instagram. Um, it's Instagram.com forward slash it's Rose Art IG. Absolutely. She did a great job. We really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Today we are looking at stories of what we call felony foodsters. These are crimes that are related to food in some way. And we're not just talking about having your cereal with orange juice instead of milk. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, putting pepperoni on your ice cream, which is apparently a real thing because I saw a picture of it. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be actual criminal charges filed for these cases. Let's get started with Danielle's story. All right. Now, I have to say, like most people, I'm a huge fan of food. So I was particularly excited about this episode. But I also worked in the service industry and restaurants for years, you guys. I'm talking multiple restaurants, everything from a tiny Italian place, a pizza shop, to even a five-star restaurant that was filled with dishes that I absolutely could not pronounce. <laughs> I'm so serious. I barely I had a hard time pronouncing the restaurant itself. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the actual meals. I thought you meant like the plates. Like oh, no. Pilate. What is this Pilate? What is a Pilate? <laughs> <laughs> bowel bowl what is that <laughs> no I, I got i got those down but the food that they served in the name of the restaurant was something else but from those years alone i have experienced things that you guys would not even believe that's for probably a patreon special so digging <laughs> into this topic i knew there was no way we were going to be let down now if you aren't aware which honestly i was not cheese in canada is ridiculously expensive and many kinds are actually impossible to come by. Did you know this, John? I knew a little bit about, yeah, cheese in, in Canada. I've been to Canada a few times. See, yeah. I know yeah. nothing about it. Honestly, don't even get me started on the whole bagged milk thing because that's like a whole other story. But mm -hmm. the cost of cheese in Canada can be up to three times higher than the cost of cheese in the U.S. So I obviously had to do a bit of research to figure out why on earth this was the case because I'm a big cheese fan. Mm -hmm. Canada uses supply management to regulate their dairy products as well as eggs and poultry. Most other countries decided to subsidize farming in the 60s and 70s. Canada said they were trying a different approach. They wanted to protect their farmers from things like fluctuation, 
and the market, as well as keep things local, money in their own economy. And they wanted to make sure that those staples remained held at very high standards for consumption. So instead of dishing over financial support to these farms for mass and cheap production, much like here in the United States, they set Mm. price minimums for the products, which actually makes them much more expensive. My dog's chiming in again. (laughs) They also have quotas and very high import taxes, as well as regulations to make sure that these farms are consistently paid for their products at the same rate so they could flourish. Now, because of this, imported cheese is hard to come by. Going into Canada, you're apparently only allowed to bring cheese for personal consumption. Mm-hmm. It has to be a maximum of $20 of cheese or 20 kilos, just whichever comes first. And now there's a motorcycle chiming in. People today are out to get me. They're like, you are. You're sending an army, John. <laughs> I have, Danielle. I've, I've set so many traps for you today because three losses in a row is too much. Oh, boy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but I'm telling you guys, anything past those $20... It requires special permits, and there's a much higher duty, and the duties are already anywhere from 250 to 400%. But they also figured, hey, working the industry this way is going to benefit the consumers as well, or so they thought. Milk, cheese, eggs, and poultry products would remain at this reliable price. Consumers would know they're getting great, great products. But as time passed, the love for cheese has grown, and people became very unsatisfied with the system. Restaurants were having a hard time getting their hands on the cheese that they needed and the amounts they needed it. I even saw that some restaurants were having to order cheese months in advance to have it for special holidays. And it also became frustrating to some people that the price limited families' abilities to purchase the quantities they needed for their family. And if you wanted a special imported cheese from France, guess what, John? You weren't getting it. Yeah. (laughs) You were not getting it. So what typically tends to happen when the price... Revolution. Cheese revolution. When the price of cheese. (laughs) When the price of cheese. And something that people want is much lower just across the border. Mm. Smuggling. Mm -hmm. Now, funny enough, the story of this notorious mozzarella mafia didn't even start with cheese. In 2012, rumors began to spread in the Niagara Region Police Department that said that many people within the department were using and smuggling steroids. The rumors were widespread enough that the Niagara Police, Canada Border Service Agency, as well as the U.S. Department of Homeland Security decided to open an internal investigation, and they had no clue what they were getting themselves into. It wasn't long before they were led to a constable named Jeff Purdy. Jeff was taking multiple trips across the border into the U.S. for short periods of time and then immediately coming right back into Canada. He made enough of these trips that authorities questioned what exactly he needed to be over in the U.S. so frequently for. Their investigation ended up leading them to Buffalo, New York, where Jeff ultimately was busted with large amounts of steroids. He had an entire operation smuggling these steroids across the border using the Peace Bridge. Jeff ended up being charged for the smuggling and was sentenced to one year in a U.S. prison. Now, how does this tie into cheese, you ask? He was only sentenced a year because of a plea deal that he took. Jeff began telling this elaborate story to authorities about being a part of a well-kept secret smuggling ring. However, this one was not involving drugs, but it was still one that Canada took very seriously. He offered to hand over names, locations, anything that authorities needed to get less time for smuggling steroids. Authorities' jaws dropped when he said that he was a part of a notorious cheese and chicken wing smuggling ring. Oh my goodness. It's two of like the best things. Some cheese and some (laughs) chicken wings. I get it. I do. So Jeff began to tell authorities that in 2009, he was approached by another Niagara officer named Scott Heron with an interesting proposition. With the expense of cheese, restaurants struggling, and their position of power working with them, Scott believed there was a lot of money to be made in the cheese and chicken wing smuggling area, I guess you could say. Mm. (laughs) Not quite sure what to call it. (laughs) Scott found a place called Buffalo Pizza Supply Company that processed large orders of cheese, obviously in Buffalo, New York. And they processed what was known as pizza bricks or, you know, these bricks of mozzarella. And Mm -hmm. since many pizza places were struggling the most because 60% of their expenses were on cheese, they figured targeting those restaurants would work the best. Heron would call the supply company, order a ton of cheese, (laughs) 
<laughs> Purdy would then use his truck to cross the Canadian border to Buffalo to pick it up. After concealing it the best that he could, he would then pass back into Canada using the Peace Bridge, where he was never searched or questioned, thanks yeah. to his warrant card proving he was a Canadian officer. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Wow. From there, Purdy would meet up with Heron at his home to unload their goodies into his garage for safekeeping. They realized at this point they needed a bit of backup to keep their operation going. It was two of them, and it was a whole lot of work taking all these steps to call in the order, show up at, you know, all the way in Buffalo, and then they would try to go to different restaurants along local southern Ontario to try and resell these cheeses, and they also were, you know police officers <laughs> yeah so wow. they started to recruit more people and it's no surprise to me that they first brought in another officer 48 year old casey langlin and so this is three police officers now they're involved in this cheese smuggling operation yeah and then they brought on a civilian named bernie polino these two individuals became in charge of scouting out new restaurants and taking in orders. And this made their operation much quicker and very successful. They were able to buy this chicken and cheese dirt cheap, skip out on the duty fees at the border using the police badge, and then they would resell it for still cheaper prices to make this profit. These restaurants were so in need of large amounts of cheese that while they questioned it, sometimes they for the most part welcomed it. No, yeah. I do want to state because I don't want to throw all these restaurants under the bus, that many deny the cheese because they knew it would cause negative impacts on the economy as a whole. They wanted to be, you know, patriotic yeah. and support their country. But a few businesses definitely came forward and admitted that they were frequently approached with these much cheaper deals on cheese. And for the most part, they all knew it likely had been smuggled in from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Authorities ended up tracking down phone calls and receipts from Buffalo Pizza Supply, and they felt they had enough to charge all three men with smuggling. But Heron ended up with a whole other charge that threatened his position as a police officer. Now, I found it very interesting while I was doing all this research that... I mean, despite how silly it sounds, saying it was a cheese smuggling ring, that it were it was these other charges that would threaten the police officer's job. You know, it's like the cheese smuggling ring. It's like, eh, well, like it was so strange to me. I mean, it legitimately was saying that like these charges were what would jeopardize his career. I think that was almost like the exact quote. Yeah, yeah. The, the cheese thing... I'm I'm struggling with it just because I understand they're trying to protect one industry by setting these regulations and the pricing in that way. Yeah. But when you're dinging into the profitability of other industries, like there's there's got to be a better mechanism there because yeah. you're always going to find this that people are going to find their way around these systems. Exactly. And you know, um the border between the US and Canada, it's not always the strongest thing. I have to say the actual border patrol, I used to watch a show about Canadian border patrol. Mm -hmm. And that is very, very stringent, very, very tough. But hopping back and forth between Canada and the U.S., it's, it's not always the hardest thing. I know also alcohol is extremely highly taxed in Canada. Okay, and I didn't know that. I'm learning all these new things. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that will come to the U.S. and, you know, buy liquor and then get it back to Canada. Or mm -hmm. if they're doing a flight, they'll be sure to hit the duty free because then they're not paying tax on it. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's strange. I know that the controls are coming from the right place, but I think at times you have to reevaluate those systems and say, is this still right for how things are nowadays and should we modify it? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that might be the case because his other charge that he got is what really <laughs> made police officers, other ones angry. So apparently during one of Purdy's runs, when he was going across the border and coming back in, he felt this overwhelming, overwhelming feeling of being watched. And so he decided to call up Heron. He said, hey, look, I'm a little bit worried. I think someone's catching on to us. So Heron, because of this, decided to use the CPIC, which is also known as the Canadian Police Information, Informa Information, Information <laughs> Check to see if Purdy's truck plates had recently been run by anyone in the local police or government agencies. Wow. So this landed him with three breach of trust charges added on top, which also sparked further disciplinary action from the police themselves. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. you. All over some cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but when you have access to systems like that yeah. and you know you're doing something wrong, yep. I mean, yeah, I'm going to take a look and see uh -huh. if they're, they're on me. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And what's interesting is we've I feel like we've spoken about this in another case before. 
And they said it was okay. Like, they were like, well, we can't technically make any legal charges against it. It was here in the U.S., I'm pretty sure. It's very interesting how this all changes country to country. But by September of that same year, Heron ended up being suspended. They can't technically terminate them unless there's legal charges that are happening. um, Mm -hmm. And slapped with the three separate charges. And the same went for Casey and Bernie. Authorities found that these men had bought over $200,000 of cheese and chicken wings to bring into Canada, and they made a profit of $165,000 while also managing to bypass a total of $325,729 in duty fees by sneaking it across the border. Yep. That's over four hundred thousand dollars basically directly in their pocket Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. absolutely insane yeah so in 2015 the mozzarella mafia were fully convicted (laughs) (laughs) mozzarella mafia (laughs) heron had the three smuggling convictions he i think was the only one with the breach of trust convictions i Mm. feel like purdy may have been slapped with one but all the information you can find on him is mainly about the steroids, which he likely started because he realized how easy it was to smuggle things across the border being a police officer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Heron only was only caught one of the breach of trust convictions. He ended up being sentenced to a total of four months in jail. Um, I don't believe he was ever actually fully fired, though. And this is where I wanted to dig even deeper because of what I just stated. Because in 2017, he was still technically a police officer. Whoa. Yeah, he had done his four months. I mean, he had smuggled hundreds of thousands of dollars across the border. But he was trying in 2017 to appeal the breach of trust charge, which, you know, impacted his career, as they stated, and it ended up being denied. So it wasn't until then that he actually, you know, decided to resign. And the judge had told him, you know, there was just way too much evidence proving that, first of all, he did access the system for personal gain and turn totally abusing his position of power and all, again, all in the name of cheese. (laughs) Yeah. And so he didn't resign until 2017. But when he did as well, that ended up making the other disciplinary actions that I guess the police force themselves could enforce. um, That all was null and void. Wow. Yeah, well... There, well, there's an aspect to if he committed a crime and then he served the time, yeah. you know, but you would think that people that have a criminal record, like, shouldn't be in law enforcement necessarily. There should be some type of mechanism. Yeah. And especially um, something like that, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, you know, if he was like a local beat cop or something mm-hmm. that, that was working in a city somewhere, Yeah. you know. The, the crime that he's conducting of moving things across the border, it's not really like it's quite in his jurisdiction. Yeah. You know, we had talked about a case before about the um, the guys in New York. It was one of the cases that I mm-hmm. had covered. And that was, I mean, they were working their own area. Like they yeah. were becoming drug yeah. dealers for the streets that they were patrolling. Mm-hmm. They were committing crimes while they were in uniform on the clock, you know. So this is a little bit different because, different, you know. Yeah. He's not running to the U.S. in the middle of his work day. So he's certainly doing this as a side business. And I guess that's kind of how they're looking at it. Yeah. Um, but, man, wow. I know. And Bernie, Casey, and Purdy, they have not really made any statements. <laughs> but Heron has, in fact, come forward and apologized from what I saw. The judge made it very clear that he abused his power. He tarnished the local police. And he actually apologized to yeah. his police officers because of the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so serious. He did. While in court, he apologized for the jokes <laughs> that were now being told. I'm so serious. Um, and Are you aware of the of the stereotype that um, people from Canada apologize for everything? It's, yes. it's like a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Maybe I yeah. need to move there because I apologize for apologizing too much all the time. <laughs> but he did. He, he apologized to them. Uh, and he, you know, again, the judge was saying you created distrust, you know, within the community yeah. towards police officers. And you were you recruited other police officers, two of them, in fact, you know, into this trouble that ended up hurting the country's economy. Um, But he did. He took accountability for his actions. He seemed very upset and, you know, very genuine. He said he made many mistakes and that he would spend the rest of his life 
bettering himself and the lives of others in the community in turn because he learned his lesson. <laughs> so I guess that I guess that's good, but it's very interesting to see like an ordinary everyday police officer suddenly get this idea. I mean, he looks like he's a part in the mafia. He's yeah. like this bigger guy and he's got like these sunglasses. It's I hope I can find a picture for you to put up for the YouTube version because I mean, he does. He looks like a part of the mafia. But he just went from being an ordinary cop to, hey, let's smuggle some cheese and chicken wings. And then he was like, oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> I messed well, up. <laughs> the fact that you're talking about police officers is the hardest part of the story to swallow. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> was it that? It was cheesy. It was, it was it a was, cheesy it joke. It was cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the, the thing I can't get out of my mind, Danielle, is I would love to see the conversations when, you know, some guy's walking into mm-hmm. a uh, a pizza yeah. place and he's got a big long jacket on. He's like, hey, you want to see what, what we've got? And he opens it up. Yeah. <laughs> There's mozzarella. There's bricks of mozzarella. Yeah. <laughs> we can get you a good deal. And we then on this a... side, raw chicken wings. <laughs> yeah. But but the truth of it is, like, think about that conversation. Like, you're mm-hmm. approaching these places saying, hey, yeah, I can I can save you some money on uh, your cheese costs and your, your wing costs there. Um, I think being a police officer help enabled some of that. And if there's anything that's really, really gross about this, it's that level because yeah. yeah, there's the crime of getting it across the border, but then there's the distribution and the distribution was likely to have happened in neighborhoods, maybe not the exact one that he was servicing as a police <laughs> officer, but certainly neighborhoods around that. And he should understand him being responsible for protecting a neighborhood. You know, I don't want to go into other neighborhoods and commit crimes because, you know, I've taken this vow of, of to protect and serve. Yeah. But you know, chicken wings. Yeah. <laughs> to protect and serve cheese and chicken wings. Exactly. <laughs> Still serving, just food this time. Right. Oh my gosh. But, you know, thank you to Niagara Falls Review, CBC News, BBC News, and actually ice.gov for all the information on today's stories. They've got lots of court documents out there. It's it's a very, very serious thing, and I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, for everyone that's here in the U.S. listening or other places around the world, enjoy your cheese if you're not paying too much for it, because... It's not always that easy as it is here. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we will be back right after this short break. Since I found HelloFresh, cooking at home has never been so easy, fun, and delicious. HelloFresh delivers a box right to my door with step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, everything that I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. They even have quick recipe options that only take 20 minutes. And they don't charge too much for their cheese. Yes, very true. Super affordable. <laughs> very this affordable month, cheese. <laughs> this month, uh, I made a creamy lemon spinach ricotta ravioli, and it tasted like it was from my favorite Italian food restaurant. I'm always surprised at just how good these meals turn out. Are you vegetarian or looking for low calorie meals? They've got you covered. HelloFresh wants to make your life easier. Easily change your delivery days, which I do quite frequently, (laughs) food preferences, (laughs) and even skip a week if you need to. HelloFresh is also focused on giving back. In 2019, they donated over 2.5 million meals to charity, and this year they're donating even more due to the crisis. We have to support great companies that give back like that. HelloFresh also has an amazing offer for our listeners. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash 80 crime after crime and use code 80 crime after crime to get a total of, you guessed it, $80 off across five boxes, including free shipping on your first box. Get contactless delivery right to your doorstep and skip that trip to the grocery store. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash 80CrimeAfterCrime and use code 80CrimeAfterCrime to get a total of $80 off across five boxes, including free shipping on your first box. Try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit today. Danielle, we've been telling our listeners about the amazing service and price of Mint Mobile, but they just took things to a whole new level. It is game over for those big guys. With Mint Mobile, not only are you going to get great network coverage and save some serious cash doing it, now they have a plan with unlimited phone, text, and data. That's right, unlimited data for only 30 bucks a month. Think about that for a second. Are you paying two or three times that price for your current provider, even more? 
The time to switch is here. The activation process is easy. It only took me a few minutes and my coverage is identical to my old big guy provider. No hours wasted in a strip mall store waiting for your number to be called. Everything is handled online and the savings wind up in your pocket. If you're not 100% satisfied, there is a seven day money back guarantee. It's no risk and all reward with Mint Mobile. Use your own phone and you can easily bring your phone number and contacts over to Mint Mobile. Need 5G? They've got it. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. That's mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Cut your unlimited wireless bill to 30 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Don't need unlimited data? Then you'll save even more. Break up with your old provider and save a mint with Mint Mobile. Welcome back, you guys, and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. Yes, please do. They're some of our biggest supporters. Mm -hmm. I love these advertisers that keep coming back. Thank Me you, too. Mint Mobile. Thank you, HelloFresh. Honestly, today's episode was inspired by our partnership with HelloFresh. That's sure why we was. thought of this food thing. <laughs> and I just love food in general. Yeah, but and cheese. <laughs> Here, John is. Is he going to take the cake? But um, Hey, I like it. <laughs> Maybe take the cheesecake. Oh, I love cheesecake. Mmm, another little interesting connection. Man, this going. all goes full circle. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, this is a story that I actually like to call a tasty three-course steal. Mm. Now, Danielle, uh, today's story might have me thinking twice the next time I see one of my favorite things in the world, a cheesecake. I also want to give everyone out there listening an official Quentin Tarantino warning because we're going to bounce around the timeline a bit here. All right. But we're starting in New York in 2016. You have a regular client at the salon you work at and you give her eyelash extensions. One day, the client says she has to come over to your home saying she's having an eyelash extension emergency and needs your help immediately. You know what that's like, right, Danielle? I've actually never had eyelash extensions, but I could see they fall out. I've seen it before. It's kind of frightening. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's, I can it's, see an eyelash extension <laughs> emergency. An emergency. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a triple E. An e, -E, -E. <laughs> To help sweeten the deal of her coming over to uh, this home, she offers to bring you some delicious cheesecake from the best bakery in New York. New York cheesecake. Who could say no to that? You sit down together on your couch and your client eats two slices while you just sort of nibble and have a few bites of your slice. The cheesecake is good until you throw up. Don't worry, I'll clean it up, says your client. She moves you to your bed as the wooziness gets worse. The last thing you see is your client sitting there next to you. She's not trying to help. She just watches as your vision goes blurry. What the heck is happening? What was in that cheesecake? And why is Victoria Nasarova just sitting there? Everything goes black. Oh, this is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. This is a horror movie. Seriously, isn't it? That's the, that's the <laughs> that, start of a nightmare. All of that just scared me so bad. <laughs> yeah, and it's not done. Oh, no. It's not done. Victoria Nasarova had jet black hair, a sultry Russian accent, and would frequently wear plush fur coats and show off plenty of diamonds. Frequently referred to as a buxom beauty, she had no trouble making friends with men or women, and in many cases, taking advantage of those friendships. A few years prior, in November of 2014, back in her homeland of Russia, she had another friend. Ala Alexinko was a 54-year-old woman whose mother had recently passed away, and Ala sold her mother's home. She made about 3 million rubles on the sale, which is about 53,000 American dollars, and she lived in an apartment right next door to Victoria Nasarova. Ala would go missing, and Russian authorities believed that Victoria killed Ala and stole her money, and they might have a very good reason to believe that they have footage from a traffic camera of Victoria driving a rental car and in the passenger seat is a body. So investigators gave her a lie detector test asking specifically if Victoria knew Alla, knew what happened to her or had anything to do with her disappearance, all of which Victoria denied. However, 
The polygraph test results said she was lying. Victoria, who has been interviewed recently, still doesn't deny that she's driving the car, but now admits there is somebody in the passenger seat, but says that they can't be sure that it's all his body because you can't see the face. However, she doesn't say who it is, and she doesn't apparently ask that person to come forward to confirm that they were in her car. But, you know, these, these are all um, pretty large red flags. <laughs> you think? Yeah. And I, I like her logic about these arguments. Yeah, but you, hey, can't you can't see her face. <laughs> yeah, you can't prove that's Allah. And it's, I don't see a face there. Uh, the investigation would be handed over to a central division. And finally, Russian police were ready to charge Victoria with the murder. They also suspected that she may also be involved in the homicide of a couple that owned an apartment, an apartment that somehow Victoria wound up selling. But... Before the authorities could bring her in, she fled the country using fake passports. Allah's body would be found months later, only two miles from Victoria Nazarova's childhood home. The body had been burned beyond recognition, and because of that, no cause of death could be determined. Dental records would be used to identify Allah. Her daughter, Nadia, would fly back to Russia to give her mother a proper memorial and recalls the end of her mother's life and the role that Victoria played in it. Quote, Nasarova talked badly about all mom's friends in the course of several previous months and manipulated her into distancing from everybody but her, Nadia Ford would say. She even suspects that Victoria helped break up Allah and her boyfriend's relationship getting him out of the apartment so that she could execute her plan. Oh my gosh, that's like some serious in-depth planning, scary, like commitment. Long-term play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah long game with, with Victoria here. Uh, here's another quote from Nadia. On September 24th, 2014, my mom received a text message which stated she was in danger and that her boyfriend was a scam artist who wanted to take her money in apartment. That phone number was later investigated. On the day of the text message, it tracks exactly to the geographical locations where Nasarova went. It was proved by detectives she used it. Her motive was to kick the boyfriend out of the apartment. So she had used a different phone, basically a phone number that they weren't familiar with. So how did Victoria wind up evading capture? Nadia says that the investigation was hampered from the start thanks to a local officer who was dirty and actually sleeping with Victoria. No, oh, man. They even had sex the same day that he conducted a search at Allah's apartment. Can you imagine that? Yeah, I'm no working next door. words. Yeah, and then I'm just going to go next door and knock on the door. Hey, pretty lady, let's spend a little <laughs> hey, time together. Hey, pretty lady. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what the heck? Oh, my uh, gosh. Um, court documents confirm that he admits to that, but almost like it's a defense for some reason. Uh, he's saying that he only slept with her after the murder. Like, that's a justification of some kind. You know, no, I wasn't sleeping with her before. <laughs> okay, and? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Daniel's head just exploded if you're not watching the video version. Um, he was eventually suspended from the police department. When Nadia and her family searched her mother's apartment, they found out that more than $17,000 in cash and jewelry were missing, along with IDs and banking information. Nadia had to deal with the reality that the person who took her mother was free and on the run. She returned to her home in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, no. Is this going where I think it's going? She was shocked when a police report with Victoria's name came up written by the NYPD. Victoria was now living in New York as well. The police report said that people she was staying with reported her for bragging about a murder she committed back in Russia. Police couldn't track her down. And it's weird because she didn't really appear to be trying to keep it a secret that she was in New York. She kept posting selfies on a Facebook profile called V Na, which is basically just the first yeah. two letters of her name, uh, always wearing fancy clothes, fur coats and diamonds. But the photos were also showing off the Manhattan skyline. So it was pretty obvious yeah. where she was. Uh, Nadia now knew that her mother's alleged killer was living possibly within blocks of her home. And she had good cause for concern. Back in 2013, Nadia's mother told her that Victoria was coming to New York and asked Nadia to show her around. So they had actually spent time together in New York before. And this woman, when she flees Russia, decides she's going back there. And of course... 
talking about the type of character. I know. Long, exactly. long play, long-term cons. Like a lot you, of effort planning. You have to wonder, is there some type of target that's, that's on Nadia now? Mm-hmm. Uh, here's another quote from her. It felt like I knew her for a long time. She's talking about when she first met her in 2013. I showed her around the city. She was acting like a rich woman. So now knowing where she lived was Nadia in Victoria's sights. Uh, she also said, it's unbearable to know you're living next to the person who took everything from you. Knowing and understanding the woman who killed your mom is walking around enjoying life in the same city as you. So Nadia kept reaching out for help. She tried to make immigration aware of Victoria's illegal entry into the country, but finally the story caught the ear of former NYPD de detective and private investigator Herman Weisberg. When I heard Ms. Ford's tragic story and how the investigation had gone cold, I became both frustrated and challenged by the amount of time that had passed. The way Nasarova was flaunting her freedom and quality of life here in New York on social media motivated me. Nadia hired him to track her down. In May of 2016, Victoria would be arrested for stealing two fur jackets worth over just 500 bucks, but was released when the connection to the homicide back in Russia wasn't made. And there were even more victims. It seems that cheesecake wasn't the only dessert Victoria liked to serve. According to her, she was also a dominatrix, finding men on websites. And she was doing this while living with a boyfriend. This woman is something else. Oh, it gets better. It oh, gets better. Oh my goodness gracious. According to NYPD, in at least three instances, she drugged and robbed the men. They suspect that there are more victims, but the men likely aren't coming forward because she targeted men that were married and looking for S&M humiliation. One of the men talked about his date with Anna, as she called herself in that profile, with a local paper. When he showed up, he was hoping that they were going to get down to business, Yeah. Mm -hmm. but said she was much more interested in serving him dinner first. She said the fish was getting cold. Quote, I took a few bites, and that's all I could remember, he said. When he woke up, his $500 in cash was gone, as well as an $800 watch. He would also learn about $2,000 in new credit card charges that he didn't make. And uh, to finish his interview with the paper, he said, she wasn't really my type. I'm starting to wonder about a lot of people that are involved in this story. Yeah. Well, I'm sure she's targeting specific types of people, particularly when she's reaching out for men like that. So um, with another victim, she stole and pawned two rings, one necklace and one money clip totaling over $50,000 under the alias Rachel Bergman, according to court documents. So just to recap... We have her drugging men, mm -hmm. one with a fish dinner. Yeah. Uh, we don't really know about Allah, but Nadia suspects that it was a similar poison food or drink situation. What about that cheesecake? Remember, everything just went mm -hmm. black as Victoria sat there watching you with her eyelash extensions. A day later, you wake up and your client has shown up again, this time with chicken soup to help you feel better. Absolutely not. Get out of here with that. Guess what happens when you eat it? Yep, back to sleep. But before you completely pass out this time, you see your friendly little client going through your stuff in your home. Days later, your landlord wakes you up. You're in bed, dressed in a nightgown. Oh, did I mention you're a woman? I, I probably should get that detail out. <laughs> It'd be weird if I woke up in a nightgown. That's, that's all I'm saying. Um, another Russian immigrant with dark hair named Olga Tasivik is the woman that we're talking about that has had the cheesecake and mm -hmm. now had uh, this chicken soup. Which, why uh, would you accept that, by the way? You know, I, th I think she was probably poisoned to the point of still Just, not really yeah, being totally out of it. Yeah, not understanding what happened. Um, so she wakes up in bed. There are pills scattered all around her. The landlord is ups upset. I mean, the scene looks like you were going to end your own life, but you know that that's not what happened. At the hospital, a doctor tells you another 40 minutes and you would have likely had a heart attack and been gone forever. Homeland Security would test the remaining cheesecake and confirm it was laced with a Russian drug called finazepam. 
also known as bonsai. It's a powerful tranquilizer. It was also found in the pills that were all over your bed. When you get back to your home, you see that several valuables are missing, but also personal documents and your passport. You realize that your friend Victoria, who resembles you quite a bit, oh, tried no. to kill you and rob you and steal your identity. But why did she come back with the soup on the second day? Olga says she wanted to kill me. She was oh, not yeah. sure the poison stayed in me because I threw up. Ooh. <gasps> I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. She threw up off the cheesecake, so Victoria wasn't sure it was going to do the trick, came back, gave her the chicken soup, planted the scene with all the drugs around her, figuring she was going to be found dead. There's an explanation. The drugs match the poison that's in her system. No muss, no fuss. Done deal. Thankfully, Olga did make a full recovery, but will never look at cheesecake the same again. And I'm sure we'll never take care of another eyelash extension emergency in her home. Once again, Victoria has pulled off a crime and is still nowhere to be found, even though she's obsessed with taking pictures of herself and posting them to Facebook. Ultimately, that vanity would bring about her downfall. Private investigator Herman Weisberg saw one selfie that caught his attention. In it, Victoria is sitting in the driver's seat of a car and is wearing reflective Ray-Ban aviator-type glasses. Busted. The first thing he notices is some custom stitching on the seat that she's sitting in. In the reflection of her sunglasses are other clues. He gets a good shot of the dashboard of the vehicle and some details from the apartment building. He starts driving around to buildings that match and investigating their parking lots, looking for the dashboard and the custom stitching one car at a time. Wow. Event, isn't that, I mean, just amazing wow. commitment. Eventually, he finds the car, a white 2015 Chrysler 300, and he starts surveillance. Soon, he has pictures and video of Victoria coming and going. He calls it in to some of his old buddies in the NYPD, and on March 2017, Victoria Nasarova would finally be captured. When she's arrested, she has Olga's passport on her. Yep, busted. They also find some of Olga's personal items in her apartment. Allah's daughter, Nadia, would say, this is some kind of miracle for me. Three years of my life and finally this person gets arrested. I was starting to think this day would never come. Her private investigator finally cracked the case, stating... She's a dangerous woman. Victoria Nasarova had to be taken off these streets. As for the cheesecake incident, Victoria had her own version or versions of the events, telling the New York Post, the last time I saw Olga, she was already not feeling good. She said she either ate something or got food poisoning. Oh, interesting how that works out. Yeah, but that's not the only story. She's also been quoted by other sources as saying, I didn't force her to eat it. <laughs> and my favorite well hold on there's one that's better olga must have pulled the poison cheesecake from under her pillow yeah i typically keep uh poison cheesecakes under my pillow i just i love her excuses around this yeah that's not a body oh that, yeah well it's a body that's in the passenger yeah, seat but I you mean, can't see her face yeah, you can't and, see yeah. her face technically and honestly yeah. she could have pulled a poison cheesecake from under her pillow she could have uh, Olga says, I know she's in jail, but I get chills every time I think she tried to kill me. I never did anything to her. She is a sadist. She likes to see people suffer. And there is yet another poisoning to add to all oh, this. No. It's Yeah, it's suspected she also poisoned her boyfriend's pet beagle. Victoria stated, it was sick. It had an epileptic episode and then died the next day. Oh, yeah. That sounds like her, her excuses after she's done someone in. I know, doesn't it? On top of grand larceny charges for the men she drugged and robbed, Victoria is also facing an attempted murder charge for what happened with Olga. She initially pled not guilty. She's facing up to 25 years in prison. In June of 2019, she took a plea deal on the larceny charges, admitting to those for a 90-day sentence and was granted time served. However, she's still being held to face the attempted murder charge. It's presumed that once she serves her time for the U.S. charges, she'll be extradited back to Russia to face charges for the murder of Allah and hopefully bring real justice to Nadia and her family. Quote, she tries to be as nice as she can, Nadia said. She acts like a sweetheart. If she knows anything about you, she will use it to become your friend and manipulate you. She uses everyone, every single person in her life. 
Now, Danielle, almost as if Victoria knew what today's show topic was going to be, and she just wanted to help me win, in uh, 2018, she decided that she was going to do something to raise awareness to how badly she's being treated at Rikers Island. I'm not kidding. She went on a hunger strike. Oh, ironic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to eat anything either if I'd been poisoning everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think they should just serve her uh, chicken soup and fish and cheesecake every day. Uh-huh. I agree with you. Um, yeah. So thank you, New York Post, ABC News, NBC News, Chasing News, and Daily Mail for info contributing to today's story. People like her really scare me. Because people that can manipulate on that sort of level, it's like, how do you just so easily not form any sort of connection with people? Yeah. Like, how is that this fly? And John, <laughs> you and your flies you're sending. <laughs> My um, evil flies. Yes. But how do you not form any sort of connection with anyone that you spend this time around? I mean, I understand. I feel like even most people, even if they went in with bad intentions for the most part, when it's everyone that you're close to, at some point in time, this fly again, I feel like, you know, you're going to form some sort of, I don't know, do you get what I'm saying? And so, yeah. it's no, like, I, does she think... have no empathy or, I mean, yes. there's got to be a lack of something entirely. She's not seeing it as a person. She's no. seeing it as a means to an end. She's seeing dollar signs when she's looking in people's eyes. She's Disgusting. checking out their items and thinking, oh, that would look good on me. Oh, I could sell that for a lot of money. Um, yeah, this, this is not someone that's operating in the same, same spectrum as the rest of us. The, um, chasing news did some interviews yeah. with her in 2018. They actually went to the jail and, and spoke to her and it's strange because like, she's extremely charming. Like oh, you can no. see the reporter that's talking to her. I mean, it's, it's kind of like they're friends. And I even had this weird feeling of like, Hey, reporter, do you know what she's done? Like, yeah, she's only on an attempted murder charge here. But do you know about back in Russia? I mean, we think that she's got at least three people that she's killed so far. And she tried to kill someone here. Well, and what worries me, too, is if she has, like, all these diamonds and expensive things, I mean, yeah. only some of those items came from a lot of those stories. I genuinely wonder, like, for all that money to live in New York, all of that, how? Yes. There's got to be, I mean, I, there has to be more, way more yeah. than anyone knows about. Well, I'm also wondering about the, because the drug being identified as a Russian drug yeah, as she well. working with somebody? Or, or did she bring it with her? I mean, is yeah. this someone that's, she's using someone else's passport to come into the country and bringing drugs along with her? Now, she had this strange bottle collection. Mm -hmm. Nadia talks about this in one of the articles. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like alcohol bottles that yeah. she would take from place to place. And I'm kind of wondering if, yeah. is, is that how she's moving some of this stuff? And in particular, there was a, uh, I think it was a type of bourbon that Nadia's mother liked. Um, and Nadia thinks that she took the bottle from her, but I'm wondering, did she offer to, you know, pour a glass for her? Oh. And that's how she, mm -hmm. she got it to her as well. Yeah. Um, but in an interesting twist, possibly, of what goes around comes around, Victoria was attacked in prison by several other inmates after an argument about the remote control for the group television. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, of course, now she's suing the jail for $5 million, claiming that corrections officers just watched the fight without intervening, and her vision has been severely damaged. I mean, what kind of thought process? It's like no one is ever allowed to do anything that might slightly inconvenience you, but you can just go around and poison and steal from everyone. And look at another situation of trying to turn yeah, something into money. Yeah, immediately into money. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird to me. So that is... It's like is, an obsession. Yeah. That's Victoria Nasarova. And uh, I know I won't forget her anytime soon. No, absolutely not. Oh, and I love cheesecake. John, way to go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, uh, we do have a couple of other stories. It's that time of the show where we kind of cover stories that weren't big enough to be the main story. The first one I want to tell you about, Danielle, is in Virginia in 2016. The manager of a Wendy's had an angry customer jump over the counter and start throwing punches at her all over an order of spicy chicken sandwiches. The manager fought back 
and in the middle of it all felt a sharp pain on her left knee. The attacking woman was literally biting her. <laughs> Talk about hangry. The manager was able to fight the woman off. The woman's name is Lovely Robinson. Isn't that a great mm. name for someone that bit you? <laughs> oh, yeah. She's not living up to it very much. But I mean, I mean, the spicy chicken sandwiches, they're pretty good. I got those a lot when I was in high school. <laughs> she was so excited about it that, yeah, she just decided, oh, I'm going to eat the manager's leg. Uh, please, please charge Robinson with malicious wounding, intentionally damaging property, preventing law enforcement from making an arrest, and trespassing. Oh, my Lovely. goodness. They're good sandwiches, but they're not worth attacking somebody like that. <laughs> Well, I found one that I like to call putting the pot in potluck. Uh-oh. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. 47-year-old Teresa Badger was a first grade teacher, and as tradition went, the school staff held a potluck on November 21st in celebration of Thanksgiving. The teachers would all bring yummy foods to an after-hour celebration, but Teresa, I guess, wanted to surprise everyone by, once again, really putting the pot in potluck. After the event, a few of the attendees reported feeling strange <laughs> and out uh -oh. of exactly and out of fear of being poisoned they went to a local hospital where both tested positive for thc it took a few weeks of Teresa confessing to a few different party goers that she had laced her dish with marijuana for her to finally be reported by the school district that she worked in now what Teresa didn't know is that some of her special treat was brought home by a party goer and fed to a child. Oh no, terrible. And the child was fine, but she did end up facing three poisoning charges. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. Wow, that's and terrible. What are, again, what are you thinking? I don't know. Did you ever find a reason? Like was she no. trying to get back at people mm -hmm. or And from the from the the way it felt when it was described that she was kind of, you know, telling people she had done it. It was almost as if she kind of thought it was a joke. Wow. Wow. And one yeah. of the people that went to the hospital had a, a very adverse reaction to it, apparently. So yeah. it wasn't yeah. a good time. Those edibles yeah, it, were not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it doesn't go well for, for everyone. Um, all right. California, 2014. High school students were driving around. And they saw their teacher standing on the side of the road. They pulled over to say hi, and they noticed he seemed like he was pretty intoxicated. The teacher asked them for a ride. They let him in the car, but apparently the conversation got really weird and scared the driver enough that he pulled over, and all the students got out of the vehicle. Oh, my gosh. The teacher demanded that they get back in. Uh, and, of course, they were worried about getting in trouble. This is their teacher, so yeah. they did. He then pulls a knife and demands that they go to Jack in the Box. <laughs> this is an emergency. Do it now. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, on the way, one of the kids is able to call police. A helicopter lights up the car, and the teacher takes off on foot. He's eventually captured and arrested for kidnapping, false imprisonment, and criminal threats. Holy crap. <laughs> Yeah, and I wonder what happened with this job. I didn't see any information around oh, that. Oh, probably not good things. And what are the chances that your, you know, your students are just like, oh look, oh look who it is? Yeah, but can you imagine like pulling it? Take me to Jack in the Box. <laughs> Take me to Jack in the Box right now. <laughs> I mean, you know, if it, if it was Taco Bell, I'd understand. But yeah, yeah. Jack in the Jack Box. in the Box, not the best choice. Yeah, their tacos aren't that great. <laughs> <laughs> They're okay. They're not that great. Now, this story I call Rossum Milk. On August 3rd, 2011, a club that you wouldn't expect was raided by government agents. In California, there's apparently a large group of individuals that believe unpasteurized milk from not only cows, but things like goats and camels, along with unwashed, unrefrigerated eggs, should be accessible to anyone that wants it. They gather in Both a group. Both people? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. two people that yes. want un unwashed eggs. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> they, they, wow. they gather in a group that they call the Rossum Food Club. It had been around for 12 years. It started off as apparently just like a little meeting in a parking lot with a cooler. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, while California does technically legally allow raw milk, it's only from permitted farms. But Rossum was gathering their milk from all sorts of random places. And they quickly grew from a cooler to an entire warehouse. 
Now, there had recently been a deadly outbreak thanks to a drug-resistant form of salmonella, and the Mm. government was in the process of shutting down any sellers or producers that could contribute to the problem. That's when they ended up finding out that Rossum had an entire storage warehouse with piles of inadequately stored food and milk. $70,000, an undisclosed amount of cash, as well as a huge supply of raw milk, eggs, produce, and frozen buffalo meat (laughs) were seized from the club supply room. The club's leader, James Stewart, was charged with 12 counts of processing and sales of raw food products, and he was also, interestingly enough, represented by Christopher Darden, who helped prosecute O.J. Simpson and managed to reduce his bond from $121,000 to $30,000. Two other individuals that ran the farm that ended up supplying most of the raw milk and eggs to Rossum Food Club were also arrested and their livestock disbanded. Now, it's interesting because the latest update that I've seen said that the two individuals that ran the farm ended up taking plea deals. They wanted to fight this. They strongly believed in what they were doing, but they took the deals. But Stewart himself, he's apparently... He was in jail as of 2012. I have not seen where this gone, but when they let him out on bail he skipped out i think he had charges in three separate counties and when he had his third court appearance he didn't come so authorities Mm. found him called him and said turn yourself in and you know what he said nope (laughs) (laughs) so he ran so once they finally found him they threw him in jail he was in there considered a flight risk and i have yet to see i wasn't able to find what exactly happened with it but i know that there's i mean there's even videos online that they posted of the government coming in raiding rossum club i don't know i don't know if they still exist technically i tried to look it up so i was like are these people still operating anywhere yeah did you get any gist about what their belief was in eating products of that type yes so there was actually a documentary i believe that was done i don't know if it was anything that was ever published it seemed like something small um their belief system was essentially that they felt they should have access to um, food products that hadn't been tainted by any chemicals or pasteurization, any other, you know, different ways you can mess with food and drinks um, sure. to alter okay. them. They didn't believe in that. So apparently you could go into this place. It wasn't just this milk and eggs and this random meat, but there was like ceviche and you could get all sorts of um, fermented foods and everything was like raw but like fermented or unpasteurized yeah. or unwashed or like meat right off of an animal. They would import this um, camel milk. And yeah. they, I mean, I understand it, but also. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, vegetarians and vegans, there's there's a big raw movement around yeah. that. And of course, organic is a huge point as well but um yeah i haven't heard about it for those types of products in particular Mm -mm. and they also were saying that um they kept track of everything like every sale it was all within the group itself like you from what i saw you had to be in the group to have access to any of this and everything was batch numbered i mean they were doing it the way you would expect and they said there was very easy tracing that could be done if there was ever an issue so they didn't believe they were doing anything wrong and so far no one had become sick um, but from also from what I've seen, they were not, I mean, apparently things were just in piles, like just stacks of meat. Yeah. So. Yeah. Doesn't sound too healthy to me. No, but... it doesn't. Not so awesome. <laughs> raw some <Yeah>. milk. <laughs> All right. Wow. Well, that is it for the stories. Um, mm. I don't know, Danielle, how are you feeling about this month? Oh, you knocked it out of the park. Oh, well, thank you. You know, you really did. Victoria scares me very badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there should be a movie about her now that I think about it. Well, yeah. There should. And I have no idea how you stumbled across her because I, I mean, this was a difficult topic. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stories. I will say that, but it's a lot of these smaller ones, like what we did at the end. And yeah. I mean, there's definitely some interesting ones out there, but I didn't even come across this one. That's insane. It was weird because the cheesecake thing she had so many different crimes, but no one was really hooking all of it together. Yeah, so exactly. So even, even when I started bumping into these things about the poison cheesecake, it was like one of these short stories. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to do a whole lot with that. Yeah. But then I started looking at her more. And then I was like, hold on. 
is this just a common name? Is this different people that's doing all this stuff? And then I started linking it all together. And I was like, no, it's not. It's the same woman. And then thankfully, in going through all that, I found a lot more details. I saw other retellings of this story that were really stripped down and simplified. Mm -hmm. They didn't mention the second day with the chicken soup. They didn't talk about that it was her landlord that actually found her. There was this very kind of simple version of, oh, she was poisoned with cheesecake. And the next day a friend showed up and she was in bed and she had pills all around her. And like, that was it's it. It's like, no, no, no. Same scary friend showed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And tried to poison her not once, but twice. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I don't Crazy. Know. And it's also so weird to me because also, I mean, just like you had an entirely other instance that led you to the cheesecake. It wasn't it wasn't the cheese in my story that was the big story originally. It was this huge steroid smuggling right, ring. Right. We always do this. It's like, it's, <laughs> at this point, I'm just like, it's just something out of this world. It's it's like a higher power that's over <laughs> that's doing this because I don't know how we manage it every time. I know. There's always some linkage. A tale of two cheeses. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So it's your time. It is your time to vote on who had the best felony foodster story. That's I, right. And I do. I honestly think John gets this one. He oh. just, you did. You did a great job. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But I don't know, man. A fourth loss in a row. I'm going to have to drink a lot of coffee. No, we've never gone um, past three. It won't happen. <laughs> uh, you can vote at our Twitter account, at Crime After Pod, for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you guys can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast and vote there. We do have a link in the description box below. I know a few people last month said that the link wasn't clickable. It should it should work. I tried it out. It was fine. And also, a lot of you were still confused about the I. There is no longer a voting option. There's no voting on the video itself. You can still click the I and be directed to the website, um, but the website is where you vote. And if for some reason the I is not there, it's always going to be linked in the description box. Yeah. And if you're voting for me, you really have to be sure to get over there and, yes. and vote. Even if you need to type in the address, crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. Yes. I know it's a lot uh, of finger movements, but you got this. Well, and there's a good reason. <laughs> there's all kinds of other stuff you'll find there, including how to find more content by Danielle mm-hmm. and myself, how to suggest show topics to us, how to join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store where you can find the new Pick Your Winner mug with our new Team John slash Team Danielle mug. Both of us on the same mug. Pick it up with this hand. I'm Team, Danie- team yeah. Danielle. Uh, pick it up with this hand. I'm Team John. So I know. You can vote every day. You can change your vote from minute I to was, minute. I was about to say, if I finish my story and you think John's going to take it, but then John flakes on, you can just swip your, switch your mug around. You'll be good. There you go. That's it. Swap <laughs> but, the mug. But we also need to say a huge thank you as always to our patrons. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It's always a good time. Plus, all of our new patrons get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. It's a lot of fun over there. That's right. And of course, we will be back on November 1st and we're starting to get into the holidays. And we've covered some kind of holiday themes before, but I have to say I am very, very excited about this one. Mm -hmm. Our next episode is Black Friday Crimes. It's going to be an interesting one because people go crazy. I wonder how many times (laughs) we're going to say the word Walmart. Oh, a lot. (laughs) Absolutely. I bet both stories end up at Walmart. (laughs) The show is produced and hosted by Danielle Helen and John Lorden. And if you enjoyed the show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way that you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.